I thought with a nod to Stephen, who was speaking earlier, it might be interesting to do a little um, slide about the comparison between New Zealand and Australia. Um, similar distributions, basically. Um, but an interesting, the, se the second bullet point there, just under 40% of adults in both countries assess themselves as having higher numeracy skills when their actual score on the um, assessment uh, measured them as having low numeracy skills. Um, and again, for both countries, the percentage who made that, who had that sort of disjuncture, um, was lower for those with higher education levels. So the higher education, the more aware you are, perhaps, of your strengths and weaknesses in, in numeracy. So numeracy matters. Um, this is a, a quote from Samantha Parsons and John Bunner. Poor numeracy skills make it difficult to function effectively in all areas of modern life, particularly for women, and they think that this is because of the kinds of jobs that women traditionally aspire to, clerical jobs and um, you know, clean, clean hands jobs, um, which often do, or increasingly do, require an element of, of numeracy. However, it isn't just those clerical jobs, because in relation to work, I put weak numeracy costs in work on the ground. You'll see why in a moment. And this is an in interesting example. Um, I mean, I can remember being confused by this as a child, a small child, I have to say, but nevertheless, um, this thing about, um, you know, if you're talking about a period of time, do you include the, the first day and the last day? This is about holiday um, entitlement and sort of filling in rotors for work. Um, people who were actually, in effect, doing themselves out of a day's pay because they had recorded the data wrongly and also entering their times wrongly because not realising that um, for full stop 15, meaning four hours and five, 15 minutes, um, you know, would in some cases be treated as 4.15 rather than 4.25 if they meant a quarter of an hour. So, um, and interestingly that the uh, supervisor concerned reminded staff again and again and thought she'd explained what the problem was and why people were doing, doing themselves out of pay, and, but it kept recurring. So this was obviously quite a sort of entrenched way of thinking about numbers, which was um, the message wasn't getting through. But it isn't just in care homes and in, in a sort of low-paid job like that, because if you remember a few years ago, uh, they got terribly confused in NASA with some European data which was in, measured in metric and the US data which was not, and that caused the loss of NASA's climate orbiter. So that was pretty serious. So what about employers? Um, I looked at a survey which Business New Zealand and uh, ITF did uh, a few years ago, um, and they asked if employers and firms believe that there are literacy and numeracy skills gaps in their workforces. And the answer came through yes. 35% said that at least some of their employees had difficulties with literacy and numeracy. And again, highest reported levels were in manufacturing, construction and infrastructure. Nobody said that literacy needs were very widespread in their workplaces, but 40% of those who had reported literacy problems felt they were moderately widespread. In other words, they were aware there was something going on. And that, in my experience, is very um, typical, and particularly an issue for numeracy, perhaps. <coughs> it's very common, um, and I'm sure Susan and workplace, work based colleagues will uh, perhaps but to comment on this, but in my experience, if you go into a workplace and you're, you know, they know that you're interested in numeracy, they're sort of, you're on the lookout for things, they still sort of quite often say, well, you know, there isn't, there's not much numeracy here. Well, I suppose people have to p fill in their timesheets or something, but, you know, they'll, they'll think of something, people will tend to think of something very obviously number related and ignore a whole lot of things, like, for example, in a, um, warehouse, for example, where you have to do the most efficient uh, sort of movements around the, a large site in order not to be sort of 
getting to where you've put something and then having to go right back to where you've just come from to pick up something else. You know, those sorts of logistical issues actually involve quite a lot of spatial understanding, quite a lot of, um, you know, a culture of collaboration about how those decisions are made and who makes them and, and whose decisions count and everything. So, um, you know, the numeracy in the broader sense is easily ignored or can easily be I invisible to those especially those who are most capable and most successfully performing it. Um, I did some research many years ago now where the, one of our findings was that people tended to um, dismiss the things which to us as researchers clearly had a strong sort of numeracy mathematical element as just common sense if they could do them. If they couldn't do them, they, they sort of recognised there might be some maths that they couldn't do. And so it was like a sort of constant um, problem that as soon as they could do something, it wasn't maths anymore. So they were still no good at maths because, you know, that was what they just done was common sense. Anyone could do that. But what you couldn't do is, is the math stuff. So, And employers, I think, suffer slightly from the same problem. That, you know, the more you know about your industry, the more you know about the procedures that... Than the less visible the actual numeracy elements can be. So I thought it'd be interesting just to have a quick glance at the review of the TEC's Workplace Literacy Fund. Um, and that found that companies of all sizes have issues with compliance, quality, health and safety, development and communication that have a language literacy and numeracy component. And health and safety and quality are two of the areas that are often picked out as being particularly relevant to um, numeracy, but I would say numeracy is throughout all of those, really. Um, yeah, so th there is concern out there in companies, obviously. So what can be done about this? Well, I think the first thing to recognise is that the sort of solutions in terms of workplace learning um, are just as varied as everything else I've been talking about today. And Karen Evans and colleagues talk about uh, sort of three types of, of workplace learning, learning through work, learning for work, and learning in work. And probably around the room today, there are people with experience in, you know, maybe several, all three, or, you know, one or two of those, those areas. Um, and of course, workplace numeracy demands vary. Some jobs are more demanding than others. And that's not necessarily because the actual uh, maths involved in the numeracy practice is more complex or difficult, but the situation may be the context in which the, you know, the work is performed may be more complex and difficult. And so I thought it would be um, perhaps interesting to look and share with you some research which is um, well, the, the report of the research is available on the website, which I'll give you at the end, but um, there's a series of articles coming out about this research on numeracy for nursing, which I mentioned in my bio that uh, I gave to Mark for the program. So this is the example, numeracy for nursing. Um, the nurse, obviously, one assumes, the younger person holding the, uh, the drug vial there. <laughs> um, and a lot of work on healthcare literacy and healthcare numeracy has focused on that interaction between the professional, the healthcare professional, and the patient. Um, you know, does the patient understand what the healthcare professional is telling them they need to do for the good of their health? Um, that's not what I'm going to be talking about today. There's some very interesting work done on that, but that's not the focus of my um, work that I'm going to talk about. 